folks, it's spoiler in time. This is the show where we take all of the work we do on our other show, Cord Killers, to figure out how to watch things. And then we talk about the things that we've watched. This week, we're going to talk about the episode three of season three of Deadwood, episode three of season three of Preacher as well, and Ant-Man and the Wasp. I'm Tom Merritt, and of course with me is my good friend Brian Brushwood. Heck yes, and as we often do on this program, because it's not Court Killers, it's the other one where we talk about the things, we're going to peek in on the summer movie draft! Oh boy. The first purge. Man. Uh, yeah. So, Tom. Million, just 13 million behind me because the first purge only made 31 million. And Ant-Man and the Wasp is not John Trucker's movie. Well. Thank goodness. <laughs> However, Incredibles 2 has made 503 million. So, really, we're just waiting until July 27th. Yeah, uh, at which point Mission Impossible Fallout happens. And uh, you never know, Tom, if it makes less than $13 million, <laughs> you could be sitting pretty. The well, first purge is going to make $13 million next weekend, actually. So, no. that's probably the end of it right no, there. No. Uh, meanwhile, I guess. I guess it's all down to Skyscraper uh, if for us to even be a contender on <sighs> Team Night Attack. I don't think it will be, July though. July 10th is my NDA. July 10th? Really? You still can't really? talk about it? I, Tom, I can give my impressions because I've seen all the trailers that are playing nonstop. I like the part where the building was really tall. I also <laughs> like the part where his leg came off. What about I the, also part like the, the part where the building's on fire? Yeah, and then the part when he was the rock, I have a lot of opinions that I can speak freely Listen, I'm, about. I'm going to say something that I personally believe is not a review and therefore does not violate any any implicit or implied agreements mm. that I entered into by walking into a theater. Hmm. Uh, don't expect anything when you go see a movie <laughs> and maybe you'll have a really good time. You know what? I can vouch for that. That's what happened with Solo. I, I I forget how what what my what level my expectations were at, but any movie it any ended movie. up being great. Were they yeah. Solo? Yes, that's that's why I say that <laughs> you need an alley oop. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I was surprised Tom, Tom missed it. I don't know why Tom, Tom missed, missed it, it. He's, completely. He was off with his uh, missing a leg up in the sky <laughs> movie, and meanwhile we were so low. Ah, <laughs> congratulations to X Modem, currently number one in the chat realm league. Oh, man. Uh, uh, love Let's you guys. go where the real action is. Yeah, right. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> well, there's a rank one, a rank two, and then like ten rank threes. Yeah, this is great. Uh, I have a feeling skyscraper and uh, um, uh, Mission Impossible are going to shake that out. Yep, and I can't wait to see how it goes. Definitely agreed. In the meantime, right. what are we talking about next, sir? Let's talk about Ant Man and the Wasp, a follow up movie to Ant Man and no one else. Uh, this is what Brian came into with expectations, going back to my earlier point. Uh, and I did not. And we agree on everything technically about the movie, but we had very different experiences, I think. Yeah. Um, positives. Had Paul Rudd in it. Oh my God. Yeah, Paul Rudd, lovable scenes with his daughter. Okay, uh, I don't I, know. I, he... Actually, I will, I will say, I will say, there's genuine chemistry. Uh, and uh, you know what? Here, I'll, I'll just, I'll. Uh, you can't separate your experience from who you are or whatever. Um, early on, this was reported that this would be more of a romantic comedy, and I love the idea of the MCU becoming robust and developing into a bunch of individual niches and bringing us stories, you know, under the fold of a Marvel uh, umbrella. Um, and, and genre I was like, movies with superheroes in them rather than superhero movies. Correct. And ultimately it was not ro romantic nor a comedy, uh, uh, or much of a comedy. There was, uh, there was one moment that was genuinely laugh out loud funny when, uh, uh, when they kept revisiting truth serum for whatever reason. And they do this re an acting thing. It just reeked of effort and people having a good time. And I loved that one moment, but outside of that, so many moments fell flat. So many jokes just didn't go anywhere. Uh, zero chemistry between Paul Rudd and Evangeline Lilly, two actors who I deeply adore. And somehow they made, uh, I, I, uh, they, 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 they made me feel like, I don't know, like just dead fish, just lay down two dead fish and you'll probably have a better time than watching the two of them on screen together. Uh, the, um, uh, another, uh, now I'm hungry. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, it, uh, uh, I, I don't know. It just felt, oh, a uh, uh, worst villain, worst, uh, terrible villain, terrible villain. Well, there were two villain, <laughs> not one villain, 
One villain, maybe kind of good. One villain, Walton Goggins. Okay. Um, there's yeah. okay. There's there is a mismanagement of resources. There's budgetary concerns, and then there's time, and then there's a failure of direction, and then there's literal crime. The use of Walton Goggins in that movie was a literal crime for which somebody should go to jail. And I don't care where it is or for how long, but but Walton Goggins is too brilliant to have been used the way he was used in that nonsense uh, salad spinner of a movie. And so you and I agree. Tell, tell me if I'm wrong about this, but you and I agree on the on the following points. Uh, story, predictable and boring at best. Yes. Uh, villains, not compelling. Uh, not only not compelling, but I, maybe maybe we're just spoiled because we just saw Thanos, who one of the most interesting villains in all movies, mm -hmm. uh, possibly in, you know, certainly in the MCU. Uh, and it was uh, to, to have the fact that he, you know, had uh, the, the follow up job was somebody who's one like like her motivation is like, I want to live. And the only way to live is to cram it up. I'm an animal. <laughs> Uh, so story villains and the, the good part was, was the comedy no. and and maybe Paul Rudd's relationship with his daughter, which by the way, did you know that that opening sequence, I, I didn't realize this till I read it, that opening sequence when they're in the was a reenactment tunnels, of, uh, is, what yeah. happened in the first movie. Yeah. 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 Um, uh, that's, that's really cute. The comedy so, was weak. I think the comedy was super, super weak. I'm pretty sure Michael Douglas. But if there's a good part. It's it's the comedic moment, right? You said the one part yes. that made you laugh was the Michael Pena uh, truth serum bit. Correct. Also, was Michael Douglas drunk the entire time? He no, no. Michael Douglas is just old, Brian. Okay, uh, but I told you did, you, did you go watch the junket interviews with Michael Douglas? No, but because he's much he's 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 clearer in the movie than he is in his interviews. Stan Lee I mean, was pretty clear. I, I mean, he's older. Not all old people are the same. Okay. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Michael Doug I don't know. Maybe Michael Douglas is drunk 24/7. That's quite possible. Uh but okay. yeah, he just talk talk talking about like moments that fall on their faces. That moment, that moment when they get the whole day on it's like I get it. You know, he's chasing after his wife who's been gone for 30 years. It's Michelle Pfeiffer. I will say, "Oh, this is another thing that I think we could agree on. Uh the de-aging stuff." Oh, so yeah. So good. Stunning. Now it is. And I think we've talked about this on the show. The rumor is that uh that uh, uh Tom Cruise pretty much has it in his contract that Tom Cruise never ages past 50. This sounds like a fake story. Probably. But uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it were true. Well, I, oh, you know what? If it is a fake story, it can now become a true story because right? I will believe it. It's I could possible. find yeah. no fault in any of the de-aging stuff. It was amazing. Uh, the uh, uh, So, um, uh, uh, yeah, but, but 30 years I'm later- I try to get to the point where- I, where we agree on all the, the aspects of this that are problematic, right? Yes. Yes. Pretty much. Yes. But uh, I still say that was great. I had a good time. Now, maybe a part that I'm starting to feel is I think parts were funnier than maybe you thought. Uh, but I think that ties into the real difference, which is I went in with no expectations. I hadn't really watched a lot of the trailers. I hadn't spent any time thinking about it. I certainly wasn't in the mind frame of I want a romantic comedy. I just sat back and I was like, well, the story's lame, uh, but I'm, I'm having fun with these jokes. I'm having fun with Paul Rudd. I'm having fun with Michael Pena. That was fine. That was great. In fact, it wasn't fine. It was great. Uh, whereas you saw the same movie I did with the same criticisms for the most part, comedy didn't work as much for you. So the entire movie fell flat. Yeah, I think, I think, so here's the thing is I, I wanted it to succeed very, very badly. And I'll be the first to admit that I went and I brought Bonnie to see it. Bonnie had never seen the original Ant-Man and she, and I'm like, well, now I can make things right. We're going to go experience this and get that same flavor in a, in a, a, a delightful way that will belong to just the two of us. Uh, I, I, I had hoped for the romantic comedy stuff like we talked about, but also every actor is insanely talented at all the budget they have is incredible. The set piece of San Francisco for chase scenes should mean this should be a wild rollicking uh, free ride. And I, I, places I love, settings I love, stories I love, universes I love, characters I love, actors I love, 
and every miss, every whiff at bat was just painful. And then at the end, when after his 30 year journey, Michael Douglas shows up, he makes it to Michelle Pfeiffer, who I guess for 30 years has lived in the exact same astronaut outfit, pooping in it or whatever, takes off her helmet and then Quantum the expect- poop, it just kind of disappears. And then the expect- uh, ex- uh, in the expectant pause, she says, it's me. Because we were all not really sure at that moment whether or not it was her or not. Because the music and the environment and the quest and the fact that he's there, you know, I don't know. It, 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 you know what? It felt beneath. It felt beneath the MCU. And I felt, I thought, I thought the MCU had evolved past this movie. I, I think when you got disappointed, smaller things started to bother you more. And it snowballed because there wasn't be. anything else to save that movie. When, when it, from my experience, I was like, oh, this is funny. This is funny. That's really funny. Uh, and then we got to the chase scene in San Francisco and I was like, mm, all right, can we get back to the funny stuff? Cause that was good. Well, and uh, what, I what, did not, I, I was, I was bored with the story. I was bored with the chase scene. What a missed opportunity for that too. Cause uh, you just brought up another promise that I was hoping for to be delivered upon, uh, which was when I saw the trailers and the whole like, uh, you know, combat with making big stuff, small and small stuff, big, there are multi-million, you know, billion dollar franchises based on so simple an idea. And instead we saw exactly the four times they made something big and or small that were in the trailer. And I was like, I felt so gypped. It's like, uh, I, I don't know, like, uh, I, you know, Portal changed all the rules for everything. And now you see Portal elements showing up in like Incredibles 2 and so on. They had such an opportunity. Uh, scale is, is, uh, is it Scale? Was that the name of the game, Bryce? That uh, was a some university project turned something? Anyway, uh, uh, they had a real opportunity and I've um, said that they didn't capitalize on it. All right. So one last thing before we move on from Ant-Man and the Wasp. What about the connective uh, uh, post credit scene? There, there were two. One is is the ant playing drums, but the real meat of it is the news clips that are showing the reactions, which we never got to see in Avengers Infinity War, the reactions of the world to people disappearing. But the more important story wise is the fact that uh, Paul Rudd's character is now stuck in the quantum realm. Uh, and they made a big deal about saying, watch out for the time vortices. The time vortex is the thing that you can't go through, Paul. And then they all disappeared. Yeah. Okay. Three things. Number one, um, His name's that, not Paul. that's one of those, that's one of those stories. That's one of those plot elements that they could have clarified because if you think about it, like, Oh wait, she got really small, but they're nowhere near the spot that she got small at. So how are they going to find her in the quantum realm? Well, two, because you can't observe something and know its location at the same time. Sure. Sure. But, but, but uh, two lines, you know, explain that, uh, say, say, Hey man, here's the thing about the quantum. We're all quantum physicists. Yeah. Everything's entangled, you know, or just say, just say in the quantum realm, everything's entangled. Once you're at the quantum realm, you're everywhere. Yeah. That's all you have to say. It doesn't have to make sense. And then, and then I'm along for the ride. Uh, second of all, that, that little post, credits bit was great and it had a two level punch one of like holy crap he's in trouble i wonder what happens to him next followed by man you know what was a good movie (laughs) like (laughs) uh, it kind of made me really sad in that moment (laughs) and then uh uh yeah the other one was just silly uh, yeah. Also, did they ever properly explain why being small gives you mind control powers over ants and imbues ants with no, uh, human-like? They, they did that in the, in the first movie. I they mean, talk did, about why but, they're able to communicate with the ants. But I don't remember what the explanation was. Okay, I just right. remember they addressed it. Okay. Yeah. And, and again, like two lines. You're like, when you're that small, everything's don't, entangled. Yeah, yeah. They're I mean, actually borrowing your brain those power. Those are the little things that don't bother me if I enjoy the movie, but totally start to accumulate. Yep. Yeah. This, guy, you, gets it. this guy gets it. All right. Uh, let's talk about Preacher episode three, uh, which is uh, oh, an adventure wait, in t- t- uh, Cassidy. T- it's Cassidy, Tulip, and Jesse. T- time out. Time out. I do have to give proper credit to another great moment. Uh, Paul Rudd channeling Michelle Pfeiffer was great. That was another great moment in there. Ah, yes. No, that that does deserve genuine uh, good. Like it's, Paul Rudd can act. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. uh, that. All right. Now, preacher, preacher right. it up. Uh, preacher. Uh, we've got a solid Tulip story. We've got a solid Cassidy story. And we've got a solid Jesse story. And they're all intertwined. Yeah. Also, Cassidy, I don't like Cassidy and Jesse not liking each other because I like both of them so much. But it really is more interesting for them to be battling right now. I get it. Oh, no, 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 hold on, hold on, hold on. 
I'm not sure we saw the same movie. Um, uh, it certainly ends with what appears to be uh, uh, Jesse, you know, uh, setting up uh, Cassidy for well, a hold, lot of hold pain. On. All I'm saying, I think you may be overinterpreting what I'm saying, is that Cassidy is after Tulip and a little jealous of Jesse. And Jesse knows that, understands that, and is trying to fend that off. Not that they hate each other. Sure. But but there certainly was strain and there was certainly that moment like it felt good to have that moment. Um, You know, you because uh, I feel like Jesse put Cassidy in the battle in the, and opened the tombs to save Cassidy. Like, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, exactly. Like, like you are left with the feeling that he's acting like, oh, this is a plaything for our amusement. But meanwhile, he's like, look, I know Cassidy can handle himself in a fight against a pedophile. Right. So I'm going to do this and we're going to play it up. I'm and upset that the way he's being about Tulip, but I don't want him to die. I think Cassidy's more angry at Jesse than Jesse is at Cassidy. Right. Too. But to me, the star of this show was <laughs> that moment that uh, Jesse casually says, uh, look, you know, uh, you're my best friend. And he's like, you never said it before. And, uh, and, as, and, uh, and I froze. I was like, Oh wait, has he? No, surely he has. And then Jesse speaking for me, he's like, no, I have to. Yes, of course I have. That'd be dumb if I didn't. He's, and he's like, nope, nope. And I firmly believe Tom that if you roll the tape back, my guess is that line has never been said aloud, just heavily implied or whatever. Yeah, and, yeah. Then, uh, and 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 my guess is that, uh, and I was like, well, I certainly hope the two of them come to an understanding and then they do. And then Jesse, again, speaking for me, like Brian Brushwood just told me to tell you because he wished it really hard that you know we're best friends. That's why we have a triangle with the three of us. And that's why this show's good. And uh, uh, separate from that, <laughs> the tulips adventure just uh, with 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 a midlife crisis god uh is amazing uh, yeah. like I, I i love i i am i'm gonna spend years trying to untangle the magical threads that cause me to go along for the absolute insane uh nihilistic free-for-all as i said before of of preacher and i don't understand it but i just know that i feel joy and love every second of every episode that I'm seeing it. And I don't know why. Because they do things like God on a motorcycle with some floozy that he picked up and they don't apologize for it. They're like, no, I really am God. Okay. I, well, yeah. Maybe I am hiding something from you. Okay. But shut up. I'm God. And Tulip pressing it because he's acting like a clown starts to treat him like a clown. And then they remind both her and the viewers at home, like, Oh no, 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 no. Please remember this is God. Yeah. And you're like, Oh yeah, no. Okay. That's right. We are, we are playing with fire here. Aren't we? Okay. And, and when she goes to see Madam Boyd, which by the way, I was like, finally we get to see Madam Boyd. This is good stuff. I like this. Uh, and I kind of clocked to the fact that the receptionist was her pretty early on. Uh, but when she's walking through all the guards on the way in, some of them are playing like a little peg game, a little, little kid's peg game. It's little stuff like that, too, that just like sets things off. And you're like, that's hilarious. It, uh, man, uh, I, and, and, and I'll tell you what, the insanity of this. We, I like the idea that Jesse has a background in uh, charlatanism and that we're getting to explore it and that mm -hmm. we're we're having that awkward at Thanksgiving when you find out that his uncle's racist or whatever. Uh, not a real thing in the story, but you understand the feeling. Um, I, 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 I have nothing but 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 good things to say about I think all this it's because it'll keep you guessing. But you kind of know where it's going, but you're not sure. Like, can I show you my dingle? No. And then later, like, OK, you can show me. And then you're like, well, I can't mean that. Oh, my God, it did. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's like, that's it. I just can. Do you want to no. know? OK, fine. I'm just showing like, really? Like, no, like they they never go where they're supposed to go. Yeah. Well, and, and I think that is because they're exceptional chess players. And that's where real magic lies is when you're able to anticipate the moves of your opponent and subvert their expectations and surprise them. And that's where yeah. the heart of all delight is. And, uh, who, man, somewhere in that beautiful, beautiful, strange alchemy between the showrunners and the directors and the writers and stuff like real magic is happening. And it's on Preacher, which, by the way, because I'm caught up on Preacher. Uh, now that uh, uh, Legion gets this good question mark, do you know? I hear great no, things. We, we abandoned it. Oh, so you and you and I are both not 
caught up yeah. on Legion. Bryce? Yep. Correct. You seem to uh, feel pretty good about Legion near the end. Uh, I also dropped off a few up like I, I I dropped off a while ago. So I, I think, was I was watching it for the show and I, then we weren't watching it. I think this is the difference between Preacher and Legion is that Preacher, pretty sure you could drop me in three seasons hence. I will have no idea what is happening, but I know who God is. And I know, and if somebody says, well, it's me, the devil, then I'll know, I know what the devil is like. They're playing and, and they don't do that filthy trick that, that Legion pulled between season one and season two, which is announcing that, oh yeah, also none of that counts anymore. Reset. Uh, this is all metaphor. This is all irony or whatever. Uh, whereas, well, uh, th that's not actually what happened in Legion, though, right? Like that was just a that yeah. was just a promo. Uh, I don't know. I right. actually, I, I, I owe Legion a finishing watching. Yeah, it sure. No, you're before right. Before I really weigh in on that at all, but I do know this much: my trust for Preacher is at an all time high. I feel like I could watch any episode in any order and really get something out of it. Let's talk about this week's episode of Deadwood that we watched. Wait, you. You're saying that like there's a secret. Are you holding a secret, Tom? Uh, it's the first time that I did not like watching Deadwood. Really? I was so bored by this episode. Okay. I understand not liking it, but being bored by it? I was bored. Yeah, I was checking okay. my watch. I... I just felt like, oh, okay, I already know Tusk from House of Cards is a bad guy. The only part that surprised me was when he laid into Alma. That that made me sit up and be like, oh, okay, because I thought he was going to treat her with kid gloves and just send her packing without any real agreement. But instead, he tried to intimidate her, which is a wrong move, which is more interesting. But everything else that happened in this episode, I'm like, yeah, I know. I know Swearingen is cowed. I know he's planning his comeback. I know. I know Bullock is worried about the election. I like. I just didn't feel like it made a lot of progress to me. I saw a lot of things that I've never seen before. I saw Alma's husband completely lose his stuff, be unable to act the gentleman in the face of Tusk in in her presence. He's he's done it before. Correct. Out on out of the mind. Correct. He's never done it in her presence. True. We also saw Tusk who previously had associations. What is his actual name? We shouldn't call it. Doesn't matter. It's going to be Hearst. Uh, we saw, we Hearst. saw Hearst who we knew had associations with murderers and muscle men. Uh, but this time we watched him full on uh, say, uh, no, I'll kill whoever I want to kill. And I will correct things as they need to be corrected. We also, and maybe this is the real crime for you, did not see Bullock until 20 five minutes into this episode. I couldn't have told you when or if we saw him. He was immaterial. It well, When he did show up, I thought, holy shoot, how long has it been? Uh, 25 minutes? And uh, 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 which which I thought was interesting. And I like that they took it upon that. Uh, also, in our schism over whether or not E.B. Farnham is literally insane, I have a theory on that. Now. Okay. All right. I, I am feeling stronger in my position after this episode than before it. And um, the uh, the real star. And I think if uh, I, I, I don't know, I don't have a time machine or a parallel reality mirror. Um, but if you had watched it just for Wu, you might have enjoyed it as much as I did. <laughs> Wu coming back from San Francisco, a changed that man. Stupid suit. Yeah. I, 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 yes, but also, you know, he learned English. He's becoming more worldly. This is also the very literal story of the immigrant experience in the in the in the USA. This is him becoming naturalized, and that bond between him and Swearingen, and the fact that that he still recommits. He's like, no, 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 you're still my guy. So much so that I'm becoming American like you, so I can be more Swedgen. You know, uh. I liked it a lot, and I'm so. Oh, and uh, Doc, the the heart, the oh, emotional God. heart of Deadwood. Yeah. No, I can't stand it. Oh, this. Uh, so yeah, that was too horrible. unpleasant for you. Yeah, that was not why very... I didn't like it. The, I just didn't think much happened. But when I say I can't stand it, it's in the best way. Like that's right. good. That's good storytelling. But there the, were there were isolated moments that didn't feel connected to me. Uh, I, now for Farnham, I have a theory okay. of why you feel the way you do. And I feel the way I do. And neither one of our opinions matter at all. Neither one of us are right or wrong. Farnham 
is Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. Far enough, remember, Deadwood often is called a Shakespearean Westwood. Mm-hmm. Rosencrantz and Guildenstern in Hamlet are they're not quite the fool. The fool in Shakespeare is generally thought of as the lower level comic character that is smarter than everybody above him, but nobody realizes it. That's that's not exactly what Farnham is. Farnham, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern think they are smarter than everyone else above them, but they aren't, and they talk crazy. And right. they are merely, they're not actually crazy. It actually doesn't matter whether they're crazy or not. They're merely there to serve the dramatic purpose of causing trouble for Hamlet and setting off various crazy things to happen. And I feel like that's Farnham. Like he's that Greek chorus who's going to say the thing that needs to be said. He feels the most Shakespearean to me of all the characters. Yeah, I agree. It's almost as though they took the dialogue lines of uh, two characters and collapsed them into one character. They had them spoken by the one actor and then they ran. And Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are positioned as one character, even though they're two characters talking. So that's an interesting parallel there. I guess let me hold on to this part and we'll, we'll try this on for size as we watch the rest of it. There are many, many characters who speak aloud to vocalize their thoughts. And I wonder if maybe that's a real thing people used to do in the age when just there wasn't enough bandwidth to talk to other people. And if you're an extrovert, you want to talk out your ideas. So you talk literally to something. In the case of uh, Swearingen, he talks to a box that contains the head of an sure, Indian. Sure, yeah. You know, if, in the case of Calamity Jane, she speaks to her whiskey bottle or, yeah, or, yeah. or you know, it, but but Farnham is the only one who I, soliloquizes. I feel like the reason it's confusing us, not confusing us, but that we're having different takes is he's merely an ex, he's merely ex, exposition at this point. Yeah. He's merely mouthing the chorus lines of the play. And so it's, it's kind of doesn't matter who he is. Uh, he's, he's meant to be like, he's meant to be representing the crowd. Who's like, uh Oh, there's an Ethiop. And you're like, Oh, you can't say that. That's horrible. Right? Like that's, that's the, that's the purpose of him. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I do think it's interesting that they've sort of introduced, uh, with this sideways vector of, bringing in um, uh, what I assume is a boyhood nanny or whatever of hers. Uh, uh, although he's clearly older than her. Never mind. He She's calls a her cook. And so she probably got into his camp at some point and he took a shine to her. I feel like they're introducing a weakness. Like he yeah, clearly has a deep affection for her. And I feel like, like, Oh, here's a person that he actually feels real emotion for. Yeah. And she returns it until she's playing uh, Mahjong in the uh, in the Chinese area and talking shit about him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't know. I uh, yeah, I rather enjoyed it. It felt like yeah, I I can see what you're saying. We're not much moved, but to me, this felt more of the chess game. It felt like uh, well, I've not seen that before. I've not seen that before. That's the farthest out in this zone they've gone and so on. And uh, I I was plenty entertained by it. Yeah. I, I, and maybe it's just, I've had one too many of those episodes uh, where I'm like, okay, yeah, I get it. We're, and it feels like this season in particular doesn't have a clear idea as clear of an idea of where it's going. Uh, so, so when uh, what's his name? Cy Tolliver. Oh, and, who's still in his? Di- okay, okay. Let's let's talk about that brief moment. There's a there's some weird. Um, uh, the last thing I needed for Cy Tolliver to make him somehow even less interesting than he's already been for a season and a half now is to intimate that maybe his come to Jesus moment is inauthentic and leave me wondering which is which. I do not care. I'm done. Yeah. I'm out. Cy Tolliver. Powers Booth, you were the best, brightest, shining star in all of season one, and you have not given me anything since. Take a moment to remember Cy Tolliver season one. And also, I guess, I guess, uh, uh, why, why is uh, uh, not Trixie the other one? Um, the the uh, Janie. Uh, 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 yeah, what? no, 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 Joni, 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 uh, announcing like, oh yeah, we don't do uh, horcraft anymore. I'm just watering the, these lawns. Don't mind me. Like, what is the point of any of this business? Oh, oh, we should. the actor's relationship with Swear Engine. Yeah, that actor biz, volumes spoken in casual asides and the reactions to each other's words. That tour was a masterclass 
in acting and conveyance of subtle, subtle emotions. And it makes me sad that you did not enjoy that as much as I did. That five minute block of him taking people around. I loved every second of it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you did. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to Olive Garden review this and say this episode of Deadwood had a lot of my favorite characters in it. How was that? Uh, explain to me the Olive Garden review. There was this famous uh, woman who would review restaurants and never say anything bad about them. And it oh. became very obvious that when she started to talk about obvious things or the decor is very lovely. I got it. That, that was a scathing review I mean, for the her. The place setting so symmetrical. I mean, my yeah. goodness. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, the plates right. virtually uh, not So chipped. we will continue with Deadwood. Anything else to, to say about it before we move on? No, uh, really liking the show. And I'm feeling this impending sadness that I've not felt since uh, since I fell in love with Firefly and knew I only had three episodes left. You know, it's uh, yeah. sneaking up on us. And I'm glad I'll be really excited. Too. Maybe that's why I was so dead inside with this episode is I, I was trying to harden myself for the eventual end. Could because be. I I have loved this journey with Deadwood too. We'll we'll talk in the after talk a little bit about our strategy for post Deadwood a post Deadwood world. Oh, I, I I will point out that some of the CG in this episode was hilarious. Like it definitely at some point Swearingen in the tour Swearingen and the actor guy just walked onto the set of World of Warcraft <laughs> as best I could tell, <laughs> like with with bad shading and everything of of the stone wall. Oh, and I was I, like, I did notice that they are trying to show new stuff like the camp is booming because I was like oh wait that's I didn't know I've never saw that at that hotel before or that restaurant over there that's there's another restaurant I didn't right, even know that right, right right yeah. So, yeah all right thanks everybody uh, for supporting us on Patreon of course if you are a patron you get spoiler in time early and you get access to our after talk episodes where we chit chat about all kinds of stuff you can support us at patreon.com slash cord killers and we'll spoil you again next time Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>